here in Hampton, South Carolina, where the Murdoch murders and the surrounding saga has been unfolding over the last year. I'm Sarah Davenport, former TV anchor and an investigative journalist. And I'm like you, I've been following this story over the last year. The problem is, only one side of the story has been told. So many people aren't speaking. Well, that changes today. Today, we have a chance to hear from Russell Lafitte, the banker who is breaking his silence. So Russell, just in full disclosure, I mean, as a journalist, I believe it's in, so important to tell people uh, the background. And so the background for me, just for people watching to know, Russell and I are um, distantly related. I think we have the same great, great grandparents or something. I probably haven't seen Russell in over a decade. Uh, I would see him at family reunions every so often. And a year ago, I believe it was about a year ago, uh, both of our kids were at the same university. And I approached him and I said, I've been following this case. I've been researching it for a year. Let me know when you want to tell your story because I see this is a huge part that's been left out. And so today, that's your chance. I want to hear your side of the story. Well, all I've wanted to ever do was, you know, live a fairly quiet life, raise my kids, enjoy time with my wife and family, and, you know, work at the bank, be right here in Hampton, County. You've been here your whole life. How would you describe that? I love Hampton. I always have. It is, to me, it's a little slice of heaven. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. You know, was, when I lived in Varnville to go to work, it would take about two minutes. I had one traffic light that I had to go through, and, and that is wonderful. How did you get to know the Murdochs? We literally grew up across the street from each other in Varnville. You know, I was closer to John Marvin, the youngest, because I'm also the youngest in my family. And so John Marvin and I would play, spend the night at each other's houses growing up, just doing things kids do, you know, play sports in the yard and play the little leagues together. I didn't play little league at all with Elliot because he was older, but with his younger brother, I played a lot. How much older is Elliot? I'm 51, Alex probably 54. He's probably three years older than I am. So just enough that, you know, if I was coming into middle school, he was already at high school. Or if I was a freshman, he would be a senior going out. So we never really hung around, had the same friends or any of that, just because of that age gap. Before 2021, how were the Murdochs perceived in Hampton? The Murdoch family has been synonymous with law enforcement for generations in Hampton County. Gellick was very involved with, you know, with helping people in, the, in politics with trying to get people elected sheriff or county council or mayor or whatever. You know, he was always, Ellick was always very involved in the politics in the 14th and judicial circuit and more and even so given it to the state level. When all this Murdoch saga came out, were you, did you start questioning them at all? I mean, or did it take a moment for you? I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, you know, it's hard to ever fathom that somebody that you know could do some of the things that you're now starting to hear. And you were hearing about the drug use and all of that. And I would never dream that. And actually I didn't believe it until after the shooting uh, say shooting uh, with um, or suicide attempt or whatever it was that Labor Day weekend, I think 2021. And after they, he went to Savannah to the hospital, they put out a toxicology report and it showed that he had drugs in his system. And till then I'd have never believed it. If you had to describe Alec Murdoch in a couple of words, what would they be? Now? Today. Today, what a, I'm trying to think of the correct term that I can say on camera. Um, a manipulative egomaniac. So you talk about manipulation. You can see that manipulation then, I guess, from the boat crash and how he manipulated the families right afterwards going into the hospital. You could probably see the manipulation of the Satterfield family, of their kids. Um, 
because Gloria was more than just a housekeeper. She was almost like a family member to them. So he manipulated some of those that were closest to him. Um, would you say he manipulated you in all this? Looking back, you know, hindsight is so easy to see all the red flags that were there of his personality and all. Absolutely. I mean, Ellett was always one of those people, he'd walk in a room, he wanted to be the center of attention, he was loud, but he was very easy to talk to. He never met a stranger. I mean, you would meet him, he would make you feel like you were the most important person and the only person in the room when you were talking. I mean, he, he knew how to work a crowd, he knew how, but now you see it and you realize, hey, this is all an act. And you look back on it and you, think, you know, when he would come into my office and always be real loud and walking in and out and talking to people as they come in, but you see that now. That was all act. It was all planned. It was all to distract you, to, you know, lower your, not inhibitions, your, I can't think of the word that you would use for that, but. Lower you know, your guard, maybe? Lower your guard on, on everything that was going on. Yeah, that was just. And it, it, that was just Alec, and you know, and now that you look back on it, you can see those things. But at the time, and you know, there was no reason to have ever suspected him of anything. I mean, he was, a, a, you know, he was a well-respected attorney in our community, in our state. I mean, he was past president or past chairman of the Trial Lawyers Association, and nobody would ever believe that of him until we it was thrust in our face and, and it was, we see what he had done and see how he had manipulated and taken advantage of people that he was there to protect. What was the law firm's relationship with uh, the bank? They were many times, oftentimes, our largest non-governmental or non-hospital customer. And I don't know if it's in testimony or from depositions or promotions, et cetera. You often refer to Ellick as the bank customer. And in some of the media and things I've read, people say, well, why do you call him bank customer if he's someone that you've known forever? Why don't you just say, my friend Ellick? Why do you say the bank customer? Well, that's what he was. He was a bank customer. But he was. Uh, you know, it's what you're seeing that I think that comes more from the federal charges where it always says the bank customer. And I thought the same thing. And I asked my attorney, I said, why don't they just say Elliot Murdoch? We all know who the bank customer is. And I think that's where that's come from. So let's talk um, about people that Elliot defended and that you ended up being conservator for. Some people think that you did this to make money off of each conservatorship, which you did make money. Absolutely. Did you see this, did you decide to become a conservator just to make the money, or were there other reasons too? I did it to help Ellie, to help the law firm. I never dreamed to, to yeah, I, I knew I was going to get paid. And I didn't do it. For, it wasn't like a second job or anything. Because really and truly, I had plenty to do without that. And actually in the last case or that I know of that he had done um, was the Satterfield case. And I just like, I, I can't do it. I don't have time, the energy or whatever, with everything was going on. And you know, he asked Chad Westendorf to do it that worked at the bank also. And he did it. So he introduced you to the idea of being a conservator. Yes. He, I remember he came in to me and asked me about, hey, can you do this? I said, I don't have any idea. You know, I, we looked in the bank policy. Obviously, you always go to the policy manual. And I walked back and spoke with my father, who was CEO and chairman of the board at the time. And he had done one for somebody. He had been a conservator for somebody. And he told me, yeah, he said, yeah, we'll do it for the law firm and fail it. What is the role 
or what did you understand the role of a conservator to be? We were supposed to take care of their money. You know, we, were, we took the place of the individual, even in, even in the lawsuit. I mean, so it, once I was appointed, you know, Alec or whoever then is my lawyer, not otherwise. And, you know, when we would get the money, we would hold it, invest it, do whatever. And, you know, to protect the money, set it up in annuities for the people, or however. So as a conservator, you can make people money, or is it just supposed to sit in the bank until they turn 18? You know, you, you would think you would try to invest it, either in stock market or in different ways to try to earn some income off of it. And that's what you would try to do, whether it be in a checking account, a CD, a savings account, loans, as I did several of those, I mean, different ways. Did you form relationships with any of the people that you were helping out? What was that like? The only ones that I formed a relationship were the Plyla girls, Hannah and Elania. Elania and Hannah. Elania was the oldest, so she was the first. You know, I, in a lot of ways, I guess I stepped in almost like a surrogate parent to her. You know, they, I would help them get cell phones, cars, insurance. I mean, we even got a house. You know, you did so much from everything, everything, so, you know, you don't realize what you need when you don't have a parent there to help. Let's talk about the Plyler girls and how you feel towards them. I mean, are you sympathetic to what they went through? Do you understand, like, they've been through hell and now it's being brought back up again? I mean, how, how do you feel towards the Plyler girls? I can't imagine what they went through. Nobody can. I saw the pictures from the accident. It was awful. I can't imagine losing my mama and my brother as they did and was sitting in a vehicle with them. I mean, no amount of money, no amount is going to ever replace that. I mean, the loss of you, she was their caregiver, and you know they, she was gone. I've been very proud of those, both Hannah and Alania, and how they've raised themselves, and become, you know, successful young women. And you know I've always been proud of that, and I think that they, hopefully, will do very good things for the rest of their life. And when you had expenses for the Plyler girls, you had to go to a judge. Like, did you have to have a paper trail? I mean, was it quick, they call you, hey, I need school supplies, and you just give it to them? Did there have to be a paper trail? Like, how does that work? We had to have receipts. And, um, and that was one of the things, sometimes it was hard to get receipts. You know, if we didn't have, I, well, I'm not saying we didn't have iPhones. I don't think we had iPhones, but then... <laughs> But uh, you, we did have cell phones with cameras that could take a picture, and, and we had a couple of issues with that over time and with them getting receipts to me because I had to be able to show the receipt for it. I mean, if there was an expense. But like both of those, I had a certain amount that I could spend for, like I said, living expenses or whatever, but you couldn't just say, oh, they need $500 for a car. No. Even though I might be under my $2,000, it had to be one of their normal expenses like allowance, gas, things like that. So in, when you're a conservator, whether it was for the Plyler girls, Hakeem Pinckney, Natasha Thomas, any of them, if you were going to do anything with their money, did you have to get approval or could you just decide, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with it? No, we could, um, we could invest, but we did go to the judge. Typically, I, I know like with the Plyla girls, who I was very involved with, they would, um, I had like, I could spend like $2,000 a month for 
normal living expenses. But if there's anything unusual, then I had to go to the judge to talk to her, like if they wanted a vehicle or something, of a house that I had to buy them at one point. You know, then I'd have to absolutely go to the judge get a, a petition for expenditure. Um, but on the loans, you know, we did not have to do that. We, you know, I'd spoken to her. She said, yeah, sure, that's fine. So we did it. And it was just an investment vehicle. You know, they were earning a lot more than they, what they were earning sitting in an account at 0 0.25, 0.5% or 0.75%. So would you say the girls earned money? So they came in with a certain amount of money. When they got their money at the end, when they turned 18, they had earned money during that time. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. And some of that money came from the loans. Yes. Are the Plyler girls missing any money? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, we heard some rumors that they were missing money I've gone back through all of their files and, well, actually I went back through Hannah's. You know, I started out, I knew what, we have the initial disbursement to me and I have to have an accounting and it has to balance every year. I've gone through that accounting and every loan we've gone back and looked and verified that the money was back, they have their money. So, Elania has all of her money. Elania never had a loan made out of her. There were two concerns. You, you have Elania's conservatorship and you have Hannah's conservatorship. Elania never had a loan made out of her conservatorship. It was loaned out of Hannah's. Hannah is where the loans were made. That's correct. Okay. And does Hannah have all of her money? Yes. It seems to the media a lot is being made up of this sandwich incident is what I'm calling it. So. You went with her, was it to buy a house? I'm not sure what we went there for. And I, I you know, I, that was brought up at a mediation. And, uh, but you know, it was a job. And you know, so I didn't even think about it. So explain to me, if you, if you take on a job, so as a professional person, if you take on a job and you go out to lunch, do you normally bill the client for that? You know, I wish I wouldn't have done it now. You know, it was a $5, $10 sandwich. I wish I'd have just paid for it. I could have, but, you know, I, I did. I expensed it, and, you know, I think that's typical if you, you know, just like all these lawyers, when they come to see you, if they have to pay for parking or they have to get a hotel or a meal, yeah, you get a bill for it. So, I mean, I don't think that's not an uncommon practice. And it's, but it is typical in business that if you go out and you're working with a client and you're on your time and you get a sandwich, you get a meal, that's part of the expense report, that's correct? Right. That's correct. Were you meticulous in keeping records of your conservatorship? I mean, is that something you would have to do as a conservator? I thought I was on, on them and I filed, you know, you made sure you filed all your reports and stuff like that. The, well, first of all, the probate judge at the end of every year should say, hey, you need to send in an accounting for whoever, and you'd make sure the money balanced and file it, make copies of it, because they keep records of everything. Because even the ones like that Ellick stole the money and I didn't get, I, I filed the zero because I, I didn't have any money from the law firm. Yeah, how, so explain to me, how does he steal money? How, how does all this work? I mean, you're being accused of being involved in all of this. Did you steal money? Did he steal money? And how did he steal it? He stole money. I didn't steal money. I wouldn't have been part of it. He would um, get a check from the law firm made out to Palmetto State Bank instead of being made out to Russell Lafitte's conservator or Russell Lafitte's PR. When they were done like that, the money was right there with him and every dime was accounted for. But he got these checks made to Palmetto State Bank. He'd come in, see me, and it, you know, say Palmetto State Bank, and he'd say, I need this check, needs to go here, 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 and here. And 
I did it because it was made to Palmetto State Bank. But I will say down in the memo line, now that I've gone back and looked at everyone, in the memo line it would reference, say, maybe Pinckney or Thomas or, or whatever, Badger. You know, I wish I would have recognized them for what they were. Maybe we weren't, wouldn't be sitting here right now doing all that we're doing, but I didn't. I did what, you know, he was my attorney because I was a conservator. He represents me. And, you know, with long-standing trust, I would have never dreamed. You know, he says, make the checks to here, 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 and here. I did it. Going back on, even in the settlement statement, it did say Palmetto State Bank. So the checks were made correctly to Palmetto State Bank. However, in reality, they should have been made to Russell Lafitte as conservator or Russell Lafitte as personal representative. If those checks would have been made like that, we wouldn't be having this discussion. That money would be there or invested or wherever, you know, once you turn 18, with, back with that. So you're saying you didn't know that these were supposed to go into right. their accounts? Absolutely. With uh, the Plyler girls, they came in, the check was made to you and it was specifically for the Plyla Girls account. That's he correct. came in then with Arthur Badger and the other ones, but it wasn't made out to you and he didn't say, this is the settlement from. Right. And so you didn't know you were managing their money. Did That's you know right. that Hakeem had money in there? I knew that they had settled. But you know, you, you, you talk to Alec and he'd say, well, you know, we got a lien we're working through, we hadn't dispersed yet. You, he would give you something, and then it just, you know, we're working full time, or I'm working full time, so we're not thinking about, hey, you know, I need to follow up. It's easy saying, oh, you should have done this. No, I mean, you got to look at it from 2012's, 14's, 15's point of view and what you know. What we know now, it's easy to say, oh, no, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't have touched a conservatorship from him with a 10-foot pole for what I know now. But the relationship through the bank, through personal lives, and all at that time, absolutely. I mean, we've no reason not to trust him when he comes in and so tells you to do this with this check or do that with that check. Do you see yourself as a participant in this, or do you see yourself as a pawn in this scheme? I was a pawn. I would never partner in something like that. I mean, it just, uh, it, and I just, I still can't fathom that why he did it or felt like he needed to do it. How do you feel like you're being portrayed in the media? A crook. Uh, you know, a conspirator with Alec, you know, and that's completely wrong. And I understand how it looks. But, you know, looks also can be deceiving. And I, I look forward to going to court and hopefully getting the truth out and letting people know, you know, what really took place. And that's part of why I'm sitting for this interview today. You know, I, I, I see just getting bashed all the time. I don't know, it's just, I, I just wish I could make people understand how this happened and how it got through. But you know, you also say, oh, how did it happen here? How did it happen? How was it not caught? And that was because he was such a good manipulator. And I mean, this went on for years and years and years. And you know, he used our relationship going back decades from being kids growing up next door to each other and family, familial relationships. And he used that and manipulated it for us to, because he knew we wouldn't question as much as we would somebody else. But now that it's said and done and you can look back, you see exactly how he did it.